Uh, yeah, it will be. Uh, and we perfect. can give you, I can, um, we can do a, a bunch of things. We'll talk later about okay. how you that perfect. video back. Okay. But, perfect. Um, we're going to let everybody enter. And um, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, we are with Jillian Morris. And Jillian, I think, how many, you've been with us quite a few, quite a while now doing the teach-in. I feel like at least three or four years, maybe more. I so I too. Yeah. I, th I think so too. And it's been wonderful. Um, Jillian is a fabulous, fabulous presenter. She loves questions. So everybody knows if your new webinar is a little bit different than Zoom, we're going to actually have you guys use the Q&A to post your questions. You can post your questions and then um, Jillian and I will um, coordinate that. We're also live on YouTube. So we'll be bringing questions in from YouTube, from Facebook, from my phone. Um, and so um, you can also chat us, the panelists. So um, if, if uh, oh wait, no, just the panelists, right? Yeah, just the panelists. Um, but it looks like we have quite a few people and you already have a question, it seems. So I'm going to turn my camera off. One thing I do want to read. It is the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And so the National Biodiversity Teaching was very, very intentional about inviting people that we wanted to put before you as some premier scientists and some wonderful uh, women in, in science. The purpose of the day is to achieve full and equal access to and participation in science for women and girls across the world. So with that, I give you the fabulous Jillian Morris. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys for having me again. Uh, and thank you so much for everyone who's watching. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about my work with sharks, uh, these incredible animals. I'm very lucky. Uh, I spend a lot of time with them, studying them, diving with them. And, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the technology that we use to actually learn more about sharks and how that helps and why it's important. Um, you probably if you've heard people talk about shark tagging or science, and maybe you don't really know what that is or why we do it. So hopefully today that's what I'm gonna cover. Um, and it isn't everything that's done to study sharks, but it is a, a good glimpse into a lot of the different tools that we use and why we're doing it. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, this audio could install. Oh, it's asking for. Okay, sorry, it's some weird. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. It came up with some weird thing on the Zoom thing. So, all right, there we go. So, I am a marine biologist, uh, which means I've studied different ocean animals, and I've been really lucky to spend most of that time. Uh, focusing on sharks. And so when I say I work with sharks, uh, these are just a few images that kind of show what that looks like. Uh, I live in Bimini in the Bahamas. And the reason I live here is because there's lots of sharks. So most of these images uh, were taken right here uh, in my backyard, which is pretty awesome. And so I'm out catching and tagging sharks, doing a lot of photo and video work. Also, I run a program called Sharks for Kids. So we teach students all over the world about these awesome animals and what's happening to them, fun facts, and how students can help save them. Now, when I tell people I work with sharks, uh, sometimes they say, wow, that sounds amazing. Other times they say, oh, that sounds really scary. So I like to show this first video. We have a lot of lemon sharks uh, throughout the Bahamas. Uh, and here in Bimini, we have them from birth all the way up to adult, which is really incredible. These are sort of teenage, a little bit younger. And if you watch, you'll see them, they're swimming around. They're getting really close to me. They're not biting, they're not attacking, right? There's this idea that a lot of people have that if you get in the water with sharks, right? That that's it, it's dangerous, it's scary. Uh, and behind me, the image you see is sort of the underwater version of this. And the reality is when you see shows on TV, the photos and videos I'm showing you now, most of the time there was something introduced into the water, some sort of bait, usually fish, to get the sharks to come hang out with us, right? They're really not interested in us. Now I could sit in this same spot all day and one shark might pass by, might be curious and come check it out, but think I'm still much bigger than them, right? I don't smell, look like something they normally encounter. So in order to get them to come in so we can make our observations, we can look at sizes, we can watch behaviors, maybe relationships, um, we have to put some bait in the water. 
Uh, this counts for big sharks as well. Uh, we've become really famous for, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna turn the volume down a little bit on this video because it may be loud. Oh, okay, there's no video on this one. Perfect, uh, audio I mean. So you can see um, much larger sharks as well, swimming very, very close to the camera. Yeah, they have teeth, you can see that, but they're not, swimming towards us, they're not aggressive. They're just this one swimming up and over the camera and you'll watch here how close it gets. This is a great hammerhead, okay? Again, in the area and hanging out with us because there is bait and getting them to go up and over with bait, right? And so it's just, it's, it's very different than you might have, you know, if you've watched shows and you obviously know people get in the water to take photos and videos, but seeing people up close and actually being able to be that close without some sort of issue. Because we hear a lot of things about sharks. They're monsters, they're man-eaters, killer shark, rogue shark, okay? They're not monsters, they're not man-eaters. Okay? Uh, and in fact, they're actually in a lot of trouble. And so at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we're doing all of this, why we're studying these animals and using different tools is because many sharks about 25% of all sharks and rays, their flat cousins, are threatened with extinction, right? Uh, that's a really big, scary number. And I'm gonna talk about another number later on. So in order to protect an animal, no matter where it lives or protect a habitat, we need to understand it. We need to know things about it. And in the case of sharks, it's gonna be, where do they go? Where do they spend their time? Where are they giving birth, right? Um, what are they eating? And so we have special tools to be able to do that. So. I'm gonna kind of highlight two different approaches for studying. And here you see on the right, I'm underwater. I have a lot of equipment, including a camera. That's a tiger shark that I'm taking some video of. And then on the left, that's a tiger shark, but it's next to the boat and we're fitting a special piece of equipment on it. So we're gonna talk about studying the same type of shark, but two very different methods and different equipment. So first up, shark tagging and tracking. You've probably heard people talk about this. You've definitely seen it if you've watched Shark Week or shows on Animal Planet. There's some apps out there you can follow sharks as well. So um, there's different methods that we use in order to tag and track. And it's not just tagging sharks. There's a lot more to it when we're collecting our data about these animals, right? So this is just some photos, just kind of general what a little bit of shark science looks like. And this is only one aspect. There's a lot of work that's done in laboratories. There's a lot of work done in aquariums or facilities with captive sharks in order to have a bit more control over what they're, the information they're gaining. But if we're working with wild sharks in this situation, we do go out fishing. So we have some different equipment that we use. If you guys have been fishing before, you've probably used a fishing rod. Okay, you put bait on the end of the hook and out you go. We don't traditionally use um, a fishing rod. We have sort of our own style uh, using buoys, lines, and hooks. So there are things called drum lines, long lines, and sometimes gill nets for smaller sharks. Um, and it's depending on what type of shark we think we're gonna catch in that area, we use different types of lines. And you can see on the right, this is a black tip and there is a hook. Um, we use special hooks so that they only go on the side of the mouth. They don't go down in the stomach and hurt the shark. Uh, and we bring it next to the boat. You can see there, or if it's small enough, we will bring the animal into the boat. That's a lemon shark on the left in a tub of water um, to keep them kind of breathing and comfortable to do our scientific workup, right? So if the shark is next to the boat, this is a bull shark and it does have a line in its mouth secured to the front of the boat. We get a line around the tail, and this is really to keep the shark right next to the boat so it doesn't thrash around. We don't want it to hurt itself, and um, we can keep it right there and collect our data very, very quickly. Now, when we do this, everybody knows their job, and we work as a team to collect all this information as quickly and safely as possible so we can let the animal go. Okay. Um, now, what you see here is we're measuring the shark. So think about a workup like going to the doctor and getting a physical or a checkup. We do a lot of the same things. So we're measuring the shark from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail. That's the same as seeing how tall you are. We're all the shark from the tip of its nose to where the tail starts and the tip of the nose to where the tail splits, okay? The top and bottom part, right? That's called the fork length 
The second one I talked about is the pre-caudal length, the caudal fin. So think of it just before the caudal fin and the total length. We're also gonna measure around the shark, sort of where the shark's armpits would be and along the body. This is the girth. And this can tell us the health of the shark. We can compare a shark of the same length to others of similar length. Um, if it's females, they might be larger. Maybe it's possible that she's pregnant. Um, or say if one's a bit thinner, maybe it's not as healthy um, if we are comparing it to sharks of a similar size. This can also help us kind of estimate the weight. We're not going to bring this bull shark in the boat and try and put it on a scale. If it was a smaller shark, we could put it on a scale. We have special scales that we can use designed. This shark, we're not going to bring in the boat, all right? Because then we'll have a 300 pound bull shark in our boat. We don't want that. We're going to leave the animal in the water, um, collect our data again really quickly and let it go. Now, one of the pieces of data or information we collect other than measurements um, is we take a little piece of tissue, usually one or two samples, depending on the project we're working on. And you can see we're clipping it from the dorsal fin, the trailing edge. This is like clipping your fingernails or cutting your hair. The animal's not feeling it, uh, but we can get the same thing, DNA. That name tag that we all have that makes us unique. But it can also tell us who we're related to. Right? If you've ever done a family tree to figure out great grandma, great, 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 great. We're not really trying to figure out great, great, great uncles, but with the case of sharks, they do not stay with their families, right? Parents don't take care of the babies and stay with them. So this helps us figure out if we've ever caught mom, dad, brothers, sisters, and if there are any sharks in the area that are related. Right? And it's sent to a lab that does this. We can also take a little bit more of tissue down from below the fin and blood, and along with this piece, figure out what the shark's been eating for up to an entire year. So think about if I clipped your fingernails and I knew that last month all you had was pizza, six months ago it was Pop-Tarts every day for breakfast, all right? Now obviously the sharks aren't eating pizza and Pop-Tarts, but it does let us see what is their diet, what habitats are they hanging out with, and right? what are their favorite foods. And the importance of that is Sharks are not always on the top of the food chain. They're not always apex predators. So where in the system do they fit? Right? What's their role in a particular ecosystem, a particular habitat, whether it's seagrass beds, mangroves, coral reefs, or open ocean? All right, so we've taken a little bit of skin and we've taken some measurements and we've already learned a lot about this animal. Now, before we let the shark go, we are gonna give it our version of a name tag. Now, there are different types of tags, ranging from very, very tiny, like these first ones, to much larger. It depends on what questions we're asking. Okay, so what do we wanna know about this animal? Also, the budget. Little tags are a lot cheaper than big tags, right? Type of shark and the size of the shark also um, helps us determine what type of tag. Now, this first one, is called a pit tag. And if any of you at home have a cat or dog that's microchipped, right? You can go home and ask. Maybe you don't know, but go home and ask. And it's in your pet and it was injected at the vet or the Humane Society, the shelter, using a syringe, just like you see here. It's a tiny little chip, just like you see down in the bottom right. And uh, it goes in there and it's got a little um, serial kind of number that goes with it. You can see on that scanner at the top. So you wave that over the pet number pops up, it's linked to your phone number, your address. So if your pet gets lost, it can be returned to you. Now we're not trying to find lost sharks, we're just giving them a name tag. We inject it just below the dorsal fin. So when we catch a shark, we wave that over it. If a number pops up, we can look in our data books and say, oh, wow, cool, we caught this shark five years ago, or we caught it two days ago, All right? For ones we caught five years ago, did it grow? Did it get any bigger? Or, wow, it's in a new area. It was caught in Florida and now it's here in the Bahamas, right? Uh, it doesn't have a phone number or an email or anything, but uh, it, it's basically an internal name tag, a very basic way. Um, if you guys, when you go to the store and you think of items and they have that little black and white code on the back that the register um, goes over either your self checkout or the little wand, uh, the barcode, this is really a barcode for sharks. Now, this is another tag you may have seen before and not really thought about. You may have seen it on the ear of a cow or a pig, these cattle tags. Right? So 
the shark's fin is made of cartilage right inside there. Think about if you bend your ears, the end of your nose, the stuff that's really flexible. So there's cartilage inside of there. That's why we use this. Now, sharks do have ears, right? Um, a lot of people think they don't, but they have two little openings on the top of their head. They have excellent hearing, but the ear is inside the head, not very easy to pierce. So we pierce the fin. And these are normally used on the ear of a cow, a pig, a goat for farm animals. And so that's where you might have seen them. And on the back side for us, though, there'll be a phone number and email. One, if somebody catches the shark, somebody else, right, they can let us know. Say, hey, I caught shark, you know, B6709. Caught it on this day, this, um, maybe they remeasured it. Or we hope that if somebody catches it, they'll let the shark go because it's got a tag. Or say somebody's scuba diving, like you saw me earlier in the water. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Maybe they can take a photo of the tag and let us know that way. So these are really just sort of an external little name tag. Another outside tag that we can use. Uh, the top one is called a spaghetti tag. Looks like a piece of spaghetti. And then there's a dart tag below it, KC dart tag. Uh, and the bull shark down below, you can see that kind of little brown thing that's trailing just below the dorsal fin, that top fin, All right? And you can see attaching, there's a special little wooden block that kind of pushes this in, goes just under the skin, and then it runs streamlined so it doesn't affect the shark swimming. And again, this has got some numbers you can see on it. So if somebody sees it or catches the shark, again, um, they can let us know and there'll be a, you know, a specific phone number, or email address. Now in the second tag, the little dart, you see that plastic thing? You can unroll that and there's a little piece of paper inside that has all the information. Again, another just really basic way for us to give these animals um, an identification. So those three tags, very simple, pretty inexpensive, pretty small. Now think about technology on your phone, right? Phones don't just make phone calls. Right? You can surf the internet, you can record a video, you can upload a video, um, you can you know, order dinner, get directions, think of all the stuff that you can do on your phone. Well, as technology changes, it's also changing for the way we study animals, not just sharks, animals in general. And that includes the type of tags we're using. So these tags are called acoustic tags. They make a noise. And you could think of it like a ringtone on your phone. All right, and every, every ringtone is different from each tag. It's really a series of beeps, but just think of it as a different song. Now, these can go on the outside or the inside of a shark. Here, we'll see it on the outside of a great hammerhead, right? That kind of black thing at the dorsal fin base. And what it does is it lives, pulses off that kind of that song. And that thing you see sticking out of the sand is called a receiver. It's really like a big underwater ear. It's listening only for those tags. And when a tag gets within a certain distance that's set, um, it will record the tag number, right? the day, the time of day, uh, and the water temperature. So what this does is it allows us to see which animals are in the area. Maybe the shark passes by once, never comes by again, because there's lots of these receivers here in Bimini. They're all around the island, right? They're all up the east coast of Florida. Um, and up through the United States and throughout the Bahamas as this big network. Um, so other animals, these go on turtles, other types of fish. So it's not just sharks they're being used on, right? So um, shark swims by, maybe it only goes by once or that shark shows up every day around three o'clock and it's hanging out with this other shark. So what it allows us to do is really understand the habitats they're using, how much time they're spending there and if they're social, right? It's a lot about their behavior. Um, without us even being in the water to see it. These tags can also be put inside the shark. So when you flip a shark over, it goes in a sleep-like state called tonic immobility. Right? And you can think of this, if you've ever had surgery or you know someone who has, they have anesthesia that makes them kind of sleepy so they don't feel what's going on. This is a natural anesthesia for sharks. So when they flip over, they're in that sleep-like state and we can actually do surgery. So a small incision is made in kind of the stomach area, uh, just under the skin. There's no vital organs there. You're not getting close to that. We can slide that tag in a few stitches. These are the same types of needles and stitches that are used on humans. Um, a couple of stitches, flip the shark over on its way. No idea what happened. Didn't feel a thing, right? And it doesn't hear the tag. We cannot hear that tag. The shark doesn't hear it. So all of a sudden there's like a beeping inside. Um, only those listening devices. 
Okay, and this can stand for about 10 years. So everywhere that shark goes around those receivers, we can learn a lot about their movement. And this heals really quickly. I've put one in a shark before and caught it a week later and it was sealed up, a little bit of a scarring, um, but yeah, they heal incredibly quickly, which is amazing. All right, just a couple more tags. So this one has a little bit more technology. This is a pop-off satellite tag. So it pops off the animal. That's a skate up at the top. And this is on a great hammerhead. And again, it's got a little attachment. And after a while, it's going to pop off, float to the surface. That antenna you see is going to transmit information up to a satellite. Right? Information like location and water depth. Right? So it's really interesting for us to see how deep do these animals dive. All right, as well as the locations that they're going. There's also a newer version of this that can kind of go on. These are two different types. Again, you can see the attachment points. That one kind of loops around the dorsal fin. As technology is changing, it's always evolving and getting better because we want to make this as easy on the animals as possible, right? And we don't want to have an impact on them or their swimming, but we really want to learn about them, especially sharks that migrate, right? Sharks that travel great distances. And this last tag is a satellite tag. So if you think about using a phone and getting directions or in the car, the GPS um, is showing you where to go. This little tag, well, it's not so little, but this tag has a little computer, that green bit you can see, and batteries. So you attach it to the fin of the shark and it swims off. Now the shark is not um, using it to get directions to a new place. And uh, even though this can send us an email, sort of like an iPhone for sharks, but they can't go on and make a TikTok video or get directions. They just, you know, swim along doing their thing, but it gives us an idea of where they're going. And anytime it comes up to the surface, there's a little sensor, touches the air. So it has to be on things like tiger sharks, oceanic white tips, makos, sharks that come to the surface, right? We need that fin to stick out. And it transmits a location and we get an email and we can actually follow that shark. So this video is just going to show you a little bit of putting uh, this on a tiger shark. We have her next to the boat. She's secured. Now you are seeing a drill. We do drill holes and attach this to the shark. Again, I told you about that cartilage. So you'll see the shark's not reacting because it's just cartilage in there, right? It's not feeling that going through. Just like think about like fingernails and hair. Right? We attach this very quickly. Shark's there, she's secure after we've collected all our other data and we let her go. Now, what we do with that, this green dot you see up here, that is where we put the tag on, all right? For example, and then every dot you're gonna see after is when this tiger shark, she was about nine feet, all right? So she's still a juvenile, she's not a full adult. She traveled, that was off the island of Saba down in um, the Dutch Caribbean. So south, much further south in the Bahamas. And you see all those green dots? Most likely she was trying to eat something at the surface, a bird, a turtle, and then she's heading down towards South America. And so we run this program. It's sort of like connect the dots on Google Earth to see where the shark is going. It's gonna turn yellow eventually and then red because we can set it to watch a certain amount of time. We could do a full year, this is a few months, we could do three years, four years, and these tags are designed ideally to stay on and give us information for about four years. All right, so you see that's the end of the track. All right, I'm gonna pause here uh, and do some questions. We'll do some more at the end, but we can pause here for just a few minutes. Uh, let me stop screen share. All right, if um, Ms. Big Mullen Hi. wants to call on a few people. Yeah, so one question that is coming to you from Ohio, Kettering Middle School, Ohio, is, is there a fish that can hurt a shark that they can't eat? Um, so when they're small, things like barracuda, goliath grouper, bigger fish, because even nurse sharks, we have a lot here, they're about 11 inches long when they're born, 11 to 12 inches. That's pretty small. And we have a lot of other fish here that are much larger than that. Things like barracudas, wahoo, the goliath groupers. So absolutely. Um, and not every shark is big. About um, over 80% of sharks are five feet or less. Okay, so uh, yes, there are large sharks, um, white sharks, whale sharks, basking sharks. Yes, there are some very large species, but 
most sharks are actually relatively small. So they do have other animals that are bigger and there certainly are fish that are bigger that can harm sharks. Great question. Couple more questions. Uh, how do we find a community tagging project in Massachusetts? Ah, so in Massachusetts, um, there is Greg Skomel, who's the researcher, and he's actually studying white sharks. And it's really incredible. He goes out, um, if you I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's cool. There's videos and he's been on lots of Shark Week shows. And he actually goes out on the boat and he follows the white sharks and he puts those sat tags, those pop-off satellite tags. This is a pole actually kind of pokes it onto the shark so they don't have to catch it. It's really incredible. And there's a lot of new technology being developed so that we don't have to even catch these animals. Uh, measuring them with laser points, so little lights that can shark and take video and photo to measure them, um, or being able to put the tag on without catching the shark. Uh, so he researched there. Um, the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy is something that works with him. Um, so you could find out, I do believe they, I don't know what age or thing, but I know you can pay to go out and see that. Um, so that's definitely something that's happened um, in Massachusetts. Um, they said, could you repeat the name, please? Uh, it's the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy out there program. I think they have options for the general public to go out and see some of the science. Perfect. What was the name of the yellow tag used? The, the thin yellow one, um, there was a spaghetti tag, was the one that was really thin. Um, below that, that was a Casey dart tag. Um, and the other, like the orange and yellow ones, those were roto tags, the ones that go on the ear of the cow. So there were a couple different yellow ones. You have quite a few um, professors and other researchers on, so that might be where that you might have been an odd question thinking it's coming from a kid. Like, what do they want to know? Geo, however, who is a fifth grade student in Streamwood, would like to know how long have you been studying sharks? I've been working with sharks for 18 years now. I did my first project. So for quite a long time, and I've been really lucky. I've traveled all over the world to work on various research projects. Um, and it's really exciting. I've spent a lot of time working with tiger sharks. Um, and then like here in the Bahamas now, spent a lot of time diving and photographing and, and documenting lemon sharks. Uh, this time of year, we have great hammerheads here. They, they migrate and they're here in the winter months. So spent a lot of time with them diving and it's amazing. And they're actually my favorite shark. So uh, this is my favorite time of year. Great question. We'll do one more and then I've got a few more photos and videos to show and then we can wrap up with some more questions. That sounds perfect. What did you study to have a career with sharks? Is it hard to get a job working with sharks? Any advice for girls who want to study sharks? Ah, so my advice for girls is remember this is for you too. I know a lot of times when you watch TV shows uh, with uh, Shark Week, other shows with the shark scientists, it's usually men. That doesn't mean women don't do this, all right? So if you're passionate about this and you're interested in it, please follow that passion, all right? Go to school, study it, get experience. Don't let anyone tell you this isn't for you, okay? Because there are amazing female scientists studying sharks, marine scientists all over the world doing really incredible work. You just might not have heard about them, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. And that doesn't mean it's not something for you. So that's my biggest piece of advice is follow that passion. Um, I actually studied behavioral biology and marine science. I was really interested in how animals behave, sharks in particular, why they behave that way. Um, I think it the world of sharks and working with sharks can be very competitive because a lot of people are really fascinated by sharks and want to work with them. So I think gaining lots of experience, um, internships, volunteering, things like that, uh, learning how to dive, um, you know, knowing how to drive a boat, fish, uh, underwater photo and video, all sorts of different skills that you can have uh, and, and be open-minded. You might have an idea of what shark science looks like. And although I'm showing you lots of cool out in the field videos, there's plenty of time spent on a computer um, trying to get funding for your project, which means the money to pay for gas for the boat, um, the equipment, the time, um, maybe a boat captain, or you have to travel someplace to study that particular shark. So there's a lot more time actually spent on the computer 
um, and doing that less exciting, less glamorous, um, the stuff that um, the talk wouldn't be quite as exciting if I just showed that, but there's a lot of that. So um, I think being open-minded to the different types of projects or opportunities that might exist with working with sharks or a particular species, um, that will really help you as well. Great question. All right, so I'm gonna show you guys a few more photos and videos, uh, and then I will definitely do some more questions. All right, hang on just a second, share the screen again. All right, so I showed uh, diving with a camera earlier. So this is another method. So um, obviously we can't take our regular camera in the ocean. Uh, so we have special housings or cases. They make them for phones. Uh, you probably guys have seen GoPros. You might have a GoPro. We use a lot of GoPros for stuff uh, as well. Drones, there's all different types of cameras that can be used um, and to take in the water. And if you've watched TV shows uh, with animals, any type of animal in the ocean, someone got in the water, someone got in the water um, in order to take that photo and video, all right, for those shows. And so that's with, oh, this one's just, this is with a, a lemon shark. It looks quite a bit larger because it's closer to the other camera taking the photo. But I'm sitting there, you can see it's pretty shallow. I'm just kneeling. Uh, again, this is one of those sub-adult lemons, but also um, underwater using scuba diving equipment, again, with my favorites, the hammerheads. Uh, so I've got that vest, uh, that holds a tank of air, that tube in my mouth is called a regulator. And this is a really, really important tool for us to be able to stay underwater and observe these animals in their natural habitat. And that could be any type of ocean animal. Uh, so it allows us to be down in their world uh, and help us see and observe things that we might otherwise miss um, and you know get to hang out down there. And there's lots of different um, other methods for research that need to be done. You need to have the time to be under there. But even if you're not a scientist, you can learn how to dive. It's really, really fun. It's an amazing way to explore a part of the world that a lot of people don't get to see, but is really, really incredible. And what the cameras can do is First off, they can help us identify individuals. We can photograph and film certain behaviors that animals are doing. Uh, we can also talk about science. So here I am, I'm actually filming a surgery on a bull shark to put one of those tags. Now, if you just saw this, you might look and go, ah, oh, what are they doing to that shark? But now we have video, we have photos and we can explain what is happening right? That tag is being inserted. Uh, the shark will then be flipped over and swim off with its acoustic tag. So we can explain why the research is happening and explain to people just like I am today, what is happening? What does shark science include? Uh, why are we doing it? What equipment is being used? So cameras are really important for that, for explaining why the research is being done. I mentioned identification. Now here in Bimini, the research station called the Shark Lab uh, has a project to identify the great hammerheads. Now, normally they're a very solitary species, but for some reason here, they come in, there's a provisioning site, means they're fed on a dive and they come here and we can have seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different sharks on a dive, which is incredible. It's the only place in the world that we know it's possible to dive with this species of hammerhead in shallow water with these numbers. Uh, and this is really important. So you can see these are all individual sharks. They're all named, just for example, the bottom left is a male called Atlas. Um, the bottom right is my absolute favorite shark in the entire world. I've been diving with her for about six years. Her name is Scylla. You can see she had an injury to her fin. She's fully recovered. So uh, most of them have names after Greek gods and goddesses. And every dive that's done, people can note down which one's in the area. Uh, there's quite a few that are regulars. We know their personalities. Uh, we recognize them. And every year, you kind of wait and hope they come back. Um, and you get really excited that they've survived another year. This species is critically endangered, which next stop is extinction. So having access to them to learn about where they're going after they leave the island, before they come back, where are they going to give birth, where are they going to breed, These, this is really, really important. So Bimini has become a critical place for understanding this particular species uh, and really significant and hopefully preventing them from becoming extinct. So our photos and videos to identify these individuals are really, really important. 
Um, other equipment that can be used uh, is a baited remote underwater video. So on this frame, there's a little thing of fish in that trap at the front. There's a camera. Stick it on the bottom, has a buoy to the top, and we wait to see what happens. Uh, this was a friend that did this one off Bimini. All right, so this one's a little bit more primitive, kind of just a fish on a stick. And this is dropped down to 800 feet. We can't dive down there. You'd have to have a submarine to go down to see what happens. All right, and there's a little light on it because obviously it's very dark down there. So this fish comes in, Jack, can't really figure out how to do this. But then another, another fish comes in. This is a big tiger shark trying to figure out if it can get a snack. And it just kind of takes the whole camera system and moves it a little bit. It's obviously quite a large animal, right? So it helps us learn what's down deep, what's down there, right? We can um, observe that world and see what different types of animals are at different depths and learn about maybe we didn't know a certain species of shark could go that deep or they spent time that deep. Uh, another method is actually putting a camera on the shark. So think of giving the shark a job, right? Uh, so this thing that you see on the fin is actually a camera and it's attached with, it looks like kitchen tongs and they have a little magnesium strip and magnesium will actually dissolve in salt water. So it breaks down. So we can put a little magnesium strip on there. It'll break down in a certain amount of time. You know, maybe it's four hours, maybe it's eight hours, maybe it's two days and it'll slowly break down and then the camera will pop open and float to the surface and that antenna you see, we can use a special device to track it to hopefully get the camera back and it's sort of like being in a video game and you're the shark. So we can watch this footage and see, well, where did the shark go? Did it chase some prey? Did it swim away from something? Did it hang out with another shark? So yeah, it's a really interesting perspective for us to understand a little bit more about the lives of these animals. So why? I've talked to you guys a lot about all the equipment very cool cameras, photo, video, tags. The why is, as I mentioned, about 25% of all sharks and rays are threatened with extinction, right? Uh, and this is a big problem. And it's happening because of this number, right? So about 100 million sharks are killed by humans every single year. Now, you've probably heard of shark finning. Yes, that's when the fins are cut off the animal while they're still alive. The fins are used to make soup. Um, and this happens everywhere, right? You can find shark fin soup in a lot of different locations, a lot of different countries, but it's not the only thing that's happening, right? So in general, overfishing, taking too many of these animals out of the water, and that could be targeting them. So that means we're trying to catch sharks. People go out specifically for sharks. They want those fins, shark meat, um, is also consumed all over the world. But then there's other products. So uh, the oil from their liver is used to make lipsticks, lotion, makeups. Uh, shark products can be found in dog food, cat food, dog treats. Um, it can be mislabeled, white fish or called something else. And so this is what's happening to these animals. And while not every shark is on top of the food chain, as I mentioned, they all play a vital role. They're keeping our oceans healthy and balanced. And no matter where we live, the ocean is a part of our life. Um, some of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean. The water we drink, the products we buy, the food we eat, right? So having healthy oceans is, is so important for all of us, no matter where we live. And having sharks in the ocean is necessary, right? They are keeping our oceans healthy and clean and balanced. Right. So with that being said, in order to prevent populations from disappearing, uh, we need to know about these animals. And that's why we're studying them. But things that you guys can do, students that are watching, if you have a favorite shark, do some research, make a poster, right? Um, share some fun facts with your family. 
um, and reusing your water bottles, your um, canvas bag. If you go to the, I know it's tricky in the world we live in right now about using, you know, um, your own containers at stores or things like that, but you can try. And, and uh, if you're near the beach or a river outside, picking up plastic and trash is awesome for the whole planet, but it's things that you can do um, to help save these incredible animals. But just learning about them today, uh, sharing some of that information um, and for some of the classrooms out there, uh, if you want to do just a general shark lesson, uh, Sharks for Kids, we offer those. Um, similar to this, we have virtual lessons we do, so I'm more than happy to schedule those. Uh, we love teaching students all about these awesome, amazing animals. Um, but yeah, so this work is incredibly important. If we don't have the information, the data about these sharks, we can't get better laws put in place. So here in the Bahamas, we have a shark sanctuary. It's illegal to catch and kill sharks. So they're protected, but those species that migrate, that travel, they don't stay in the Bahamas and they don't know where they're safe or not safe. They just follow their normal migration route. So if they swim over to Florida, not safe, right? Or further north or south in the Caribbean, not safe. So if we understand where these animals are going, particularly where they're giving birth um, or if they're going to mate and we protect those areas, then the population as a whole is a better chance of surviving. But we need this data, we need this information in order to do that. So it's really, really important for protecting these species. But that applies to any animal, um, whether they live on land or in the ocean. All right. So do you guys have some more questions for me? They have a lot of great questions. And I want to apologize. I'm, I'm, I have my granddaughter with me. Of course, I have my granddaughter with me for International Day of Women and Girls in Science. So if you hear in the background, that, that's her. I apologize. So the first question is from Kim. Have any shark, uh, sharks bit anyone during a time to study a shark? Um, yes. So shark bites are extremely rare. But if you're working with and handling animals, um, it, it does happen. And it's particularly usually smaller sharks. Um, and you think of you've got to be really gentle with them too. It's just like having a small puppy or a kitten. Um, and so lemon sharks in particular are very, very flexible. These ones behind me, they can actually bite their own tails. That cartilage is really flexible. Um, so yes, yeah, sometimes handling the sharks. I've never been bitten, but yes, it does happen. Um, and it's not because the shark is trying to bite someone and attack them. It's simply because they can't say, hey, let go of me or what's going on. They have teeth and they're trying to get away because they don't, they're trying to survive. They don't understand. So yes, um, bites do happen. It's very, very rare, but it does happen. Do you have another question? So sorry. <laughs> um, from Streamwood, Illinois, we have, how can you help to cure a shark if it becomes sick? Great question. Well, yeah, it really depends. Um, if a shark, and they do get sick, all right, you might have heard people say, oh, sharks don't get cancer. So if you take their shark cartilage pills, um, it'll prevent cancer or cure cancer. Absolutely not. We know that at least some species have uh, and, and do get cancer. So, um, and there's no health benefits to consuming those pills. Um, it would depend if the, if the shark was in a facility such as an aquarium, uh, depending on what is happening with it, it could be helped. But out in the wild, not necessarily a lot that we could do. Um, if we see a shark that's maybe got um, fishing line on it or some other hooks or some debris, um, it could be cut off um, or try to remove so it doesn't cause. Uh, any more harm to the animal, um, or if they're caught and they're, you know, not able to swim around and get food, or if it's a shark that has to swim to breathe. Not every shark has to swim to breathe, but some of them do. Uh, so you can assist like that, but it's really difficult out in the wild um, for us to be able to do anything unless we can physically see it and have access to the animal. But certainly if they're in a facility like an aquarium and they become sick, then there are veterinarians that specialize in ocean animals. Um, so just like you take your cat or dog to the vet, um, they can be seen and figured out what they can do to help that animal. Excellent. Natalie uh, from uh, Glenbrook Elementary in Streamwood asks, what is your favorite type of shark? The great hammerhead is my favorite animal in the world. They are amazing. Um, I love spending time with them. Uh, like I said, Scylla is my favorite shark. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the water with her and 
just, they're so beautiful. And I just want everyone to see how amazing they are and to learn more about them because they are critically endangered. And I want to see them survive. They're important, not only just because they're amazing, but they're also really, really important for our ocean. Um, uh, McKenna from Kettering, Ohio would like to know, how do you keep the sharks from hurting you when you first catch it? Ah, so the shark does have a line in its mouth. And so when we bring it in, we make sure we're, we're watching ourselves. We usually get a hold of either the pectoral fins or the dorsal fin. So we can bring the shark into the boat and we get that line around its tail to secure it. So, um, because again, we cannot explain, you might have a pet at home that does not like going to the vet and you can kind of comfort them and talk to them and maybe you have treats for them to make it better. But we can't really do that with the shark. Uh, we can't explain what's going on. We can't really comfort them and kind of, you know, pet them. And that, that's not going to work with a shark. Um, so we can't really explain. So of course, they're going to try and escape. So when we're bringing them in, we're just really, really careful. Everyone's very well trained with handling these animals um, and getting them secured next to the boat or in a, a thing of water, uh, like a trough that you saw, um, so that we can collect our data very quickly and let them go. Um, Ava from Kettering as well would like to know the largest shark you have ever seen. Uh, so the largest shark, I have seen one basking shark from a boat and that was probably, it was probably about 20 feet, I think, which isn't quite as big as they get. Um, I've also seen a whale shark. Um, and that was a smaller one, probably, um, probably about the same size. Uh, in the water though, the largest one I've ever been with in the water was a white shark, a great white that was probably about 16 or 17 feet long. Um, so that's the biggest one I've been in the water with uh, and they are incredible. That is amazing. <laughs> uh, Sarah from Kettering, Ohio, do sharks ever eat other sharks? Absolutely. So the great hammerheads I've been talking about, they'll eat black tips. They also eat stingrays, um, like southern stingrays or spotted eagle rays, which are their flat shark cousins. Uh, and then um, bull sharks, tiger sharks, yeah, uh, they will scavenge, they'll hunt um, on other sharks. So absolutely that happens. Um, Harrison from Kettering, do all sharks take naps upside down? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So it is kind of like a nap um, that we know of. Uh, yes, it puts them in that sleep like state. Um, it has not been done with every species of shark. They're over 500. Um, so, but based on their sensory systems that we know they have, um, yeah, I would, it would, that's what we believe is true. Has it been done with every shark? No, um, but with every species, um, that it has been done with, this is what happens. They go in that sleep-like state. Excellent. This is a student from U46, but I'm not sure which school. If you see that a shark is injured, do you have a place where you could keep them while they heal? So on the island here, uh, the shark lab has sort of these outdoor pens. Think of a pasture where you might see a horse or a cow, uh, the fences in the water. And there have been injured sharks that have been put in there to just let them kind of have time. They don't have to worry about, you know, swimming away from predators, hiding out. They're sort of in a safe space to let like a physical injury, a big cut, a bite heal. And again, they heal very, very quickly. These animals are incredible. Think about if you had a big cut on your hand and you went in the water every day, it's not gonna heal up, all right? So you have to stay dry or keep it dry. Um, and But sharks can heal really quickly. So yeah, that's probably the only option really and, and similar to other spaces that if they have kind of a holding pen in the water, uh, an injured shark could be placed in there, um, given you know food so that it is able to eat, but also to just kind of rest and recover and let that body heal before it's released. So that your answer has me curious about wanting to know about their cell division, but I'll, I'll do that on my own and follow up with you. <laughs> um, Aubrey from Kettering would like to know, are you ever scared working with sharks? I'm not. Um, I always respect them. Uh, I love sharks, but I don't try and snuggle them or cuddle them or ride them or, you know, we do handle them when we're doing uh, the tagging, but underwater, we're not touching them. And um, so I do have um, a huge amount of respect. They're wild animals and they always deserve our respect. Um, and so I'm not afraid of being underwater with them. I am just amazed every time I'm in there. I just, they're incredible to see and to be able to 
watch such a fascinating animal in its natural habitat is is really I feel really really lucky to spend as much time with them as I do um, so I'm not afraid um, always just sort of in awe and very respectful of, of what they are yes seems very wise Jason from Kettering Kettering lots of curious students in Kettering um, do different types of sharks get along um, yeah, absolutely. So we'll see like where these lemon sharks are. We see nurse sharks as well. And they seem to kind of um, hang out together and, and not have a problem. Um, on the hammerhead dive, we have lots of nurse sharks. Uh, we also have a tiger shark uh, that occasionally comes in. And uh, sometimes the hammerheads seem to get um, what we would decide like kind of call frustrated. Um, again, I doubt it's the animal actually getting frustrated, but uh, with the nurse sharks, because there's a lot of them and sometimes they get in way and get around the person who's feeding and it kind of blocks the hammerheads. Um, and so, but yeah, but definitely in certain areas, um, you'll see different species uh, hanging out together with no issue. From Kettering, how deep, um, how deep is the deepest depth you have seen a shark? Um, I've seen a shark in probably a hundred um, feet or so diving, um, but I have a friend, uh, he's a deep sea scientist and he tagged a shark and I don't know, he's tagged them in 600, 800 feet, um, maybe slightly deeper than that. Um, but yeah, so people do see them, but they are using submarines to go down and explore. And um, they've definitely been seen deeper uh, than that. There are, you know, deep sea sharks that are found at thousands of feet, um, which is really, really incredible. But I've not, I've never been in a submarine to go down and see that would be really cool. Um, but yeah, there are people who definitely study deep sea sharks using submarines, which is awesome. All right. This one is, hi, my name is Shelter and my, I hope I'm saying that right. I apologize if I'm not. My name is Shelter and my question is, why did you choose to study sharks? So I grew up in Maine and I used to go to the beach a lot with my family and explore tide pools and loved all the cool ocean animals. And then we used to go to Florida for my dad's work. And so when I was eight, we went snorkeling and I saw a nurse shark and it was the first time I saw a shark and I was just fascinated like this is so cool and then found some books and wanted to learn more and that really um, never went away so the more I learned about them the more I wanted to learn and then as I started spending time with them when I got older and yeah I just I really wanted to know more about them and then I really wanted to share that information with people I wanted them to realize they're not man-eating monsters I wanted them to see the beautiful fascinating creatures that I was seeing and how important they are. So I wanted to share that information. I wanted to share that story. I wanted to other people to come with me to see it um, because we hear so many negative and incorrect things about sharks. Uh, and so a lot of people around the world are really, really afraid of them, even if they've never seen one, but some crazy movie or a news article. Uh, and I wanted the reality of sharks to be out there for people to understand that they're not these monsters and actually they really need our help. Yeah. This is a perfect segue because the next question is from Donna and she'd like to know how to contact your, your group for the remote talks and how can they get on a mailing list for you? Ah, absolutely. So if you visit the website, it's wwsharks the number four kids.com. I can type it in after as well. So it's sharksforkids.com. Uh, you can schedule, there's a form right on there. You can reach out, schedule the lesson. Uh, there's lots of fun uh, activities, videos, lesson plans, curriculum, um, crafts. We have some cool Valentines, new Valentines we just came out with. Um, and uh, yeah, so have an explore and you can connect with us and sign up for the newsletter right there. You have so many questions and they just keep coming. So um, when did you first realize that you wanted to start doing marine biology and working with sharks? And this is a student from U46. I told my parents I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was five um, and it just never disappeared. And probably sharks around after I saw that nurse shark, so eight or nine. And then I still have a letter that I wrote when I was nine to my teacher about why I wanted to be a marine biologist. So uh, pretty young and it just never changed. And so, yeah, so students out there watching, if you're interested in this, follow that passion. Um, work at it just because you're younger doesn't mean you can't do it. Stick with it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an amazing career. There's so many different options and ways to get involved. So funny because the next question is, can you recommend any summer camps or study groups for high school students to study sharks? 
So uh, there are different programs. Um, C Camp in the Florida Keys. I know the Island School in Eleuther here in the Bahamas. Um, the Shark, it depends on the age. Um, so when you're 18 or over, you can volunteer um, for um, at the Shark Lab here. But we've also brought student groups in. We had last year, um, before everything shut down, um, my mom is a teacher in Maine and she actually brought a high school group. Uh, and we had another teacher from New York bring a high school group and we kind of partnered with them to have students come uh, over spring breaks and actually get experience. So that's something that we're exploring doing more of. Again, you can reach out and contact me um, and we're working on um, another sort of program we're developing that's in Florida as well. So definitely reach out and I, you know, I can give you some more information on um, that, but also you can explore C Camp, which is in the Florida Keys uh, and as well as um, the, the Island School or the Cape Eleuther Institute, which is on the island of Eleuther in the Bahamas. They have programs for students in the summer as well. Awesome. Here's a couple more questions and then I think we've got to wrap it up. But typically, how far do sharks travel? And then a, a follow up to that is, is there any research on why Bimini attracts more sharks than most areas? So the Bahamas in general, I'll answer that one first. The Bahamas in general is considered the shark diving capital of the world because we do have, um, you know, more people come here to swim with sharks than any other place. And the reason Bimini and the Bahamas in particular, Bimini is very close to the Gulf Stream. So nutrient rich waters are coming up. We also have seagrass beds. We have incredible mangrove systems, which act as a nursery area for lots of juvenile species, fish, conch, lobster, turtles, and sharks, um, coral reefs. Uh, so lots of incredible habitats and uh, lots of, of nutrients in the water, uh, which kind of feeds the food chain. So it means there's a lot of food for these animals as well. So habitats for them to survive, to hide in, to find food and lots of food. Um, so really it's for us, it's our proximity to the Gulf Stream, um, but other islands in the Bahamas, it's really just these healthy habitats. Um, and also the fact that there's no, um, there's no long lining, which can devastate an area. Uh, and also that it's a shark sanctuary. So these animals are protected. Oh, and the my oh sorry. And your other question is how they can migrate thousands of miles. Uh, tiger sharks, makos, white sharks, whale sharks um, have all been, um, you know, uh, found and like tagged, and and we know that um, they yeah they travel thousands of miles. And it's it's really interesting because they'll actually um, certain sharks will follow a very similar when we look at those patterns, kind of those dots I showed you, you can watch and some sharks will follow a similar pattern year after year after year, even though they don't have a road map or an ocean map. Um, and I think there was one um, Mako shark that actually um, traveled, I think it was just over 13,000 miles in two years. I mean, that's incredible, but following a very similar pattern, um, which is really, really incredible. So yeah, they cover some distance. Amazing. So I hope you will um, oblige me. I am, you're a marine biologist. I don't know if all the students know that there's such a thing as a freshwater biologist. I'm a freshwater biologist. I'm a limnologist. And so as a limnologist, there are three cross-cutting patterns that I love. And I, I hope you have like two seconds to stay with us for a little bit longer. I'm dying to know which, you, which of the cross-cutting concepts are your favorite to explore. These are my three favorite. Do you like studying patterns, cause and effect, or structure and function best? I think cause and effect, because I think it's right now we're looking at impact, human impact. Um, and I think that we're seeing there's natural cause and effect in predator prey systems, but we're now seeing such an influence <clears throat> from human impact. I think that to me is the most important right now because it's the most significant as far as conservation. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you again. Um, we really appreciate you. Um, thank you everyone for being here. We know we didn't get to everyone's questions. So go to sharksforkids.com. It's in the chat. Go get more answers um, and watch the other live programs. And thank you again for being here. And I hope you'll join us again next year. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, you guys check out the website. You can send us questions there as well. Thank you so much.